Well, that's, that's not all that's starting up this spring. There's uh, this little thing called spring training. I don't know if you've heard of it or if you're a baseball fan. Are, would any of you say that you enjoy the game of baseball? All right, a lot of you. Okay, that's great. Fantastic. Those of you who don't, um, you don't know what you're missing, I guess. So, uh, Baseball. Baseball is a, is a very special game to our family. It was something uh, my brother played for a while, and it's something that, you know, I enjoy as things get ramped up. We actually already, if you can believe this, the college baseball season has already begun, and my nephew, who plays for the University of Louisville, has had a couple of games in, um, in Florida already. He will be playing next weekend in, in Louisville, I believe it is. So um, in case you're wondering, uh, this is one of the reasons why teams north of the Mason-Dixon line uh, seem to struggle sometimes in baseball because they'll be playing baseball in weather that really wasn't meant to be played in. Um, however, however, baseball is starting back up. And one of the things that I love about baseball that some, is something that people you know, often don't really care for is the pace of the game, you know? I mean, sometimes people say, well, baseball is, you know, it's too slow, it's boring. Not enough scoring, something like that, you know? And I, I kind of think of it this way, you know, it's a summer game. There's a game on every evening and summer's kind of slower and, you know, the, the days are longer and all of that. So you can just kind of sit back and kind of in, enjoy it. You know, things don't have to go that fast. That's one of the things I like about baseball. But I, I will admit that those of you who, who are frustrated about the slowness of the game, I can sympathize with you in one respect. Something has happened in the game of baseball in the last 10 years or so where the, something that's called the analytics has really ramped up. And if you know anything about baseball, it, it's a statistically driven game. There are statistics for everything. And people who analyze statistics have really done a pretty good job of determining what the probabilities are for success in any of several different scenarios. Well, that's neat and it's a great competitive advantage if you can figure out the analytics and your team maybe doesn't have a lot of money to spend on high price free agents. Here's where it becomes a problem for the fan. When you decide, okay, in this situation, situation, I'm going to throw a left-handed pitcher, but when this next guy gets up, I'm going to throw a right-handed pitcher, and before you know it, there's like 17 pitching changes in the game, and everybody's just waiting and waiting and waiting. It's kind of, kind of a drag. One of the things that, you know, the, the, the analytics focus has taught us some things about the game of baseball, but one thing it doesn't seem to be able to capture is the, the it factor, the intangibles. And if you've ever been on a team, you realize that there are certain intangibles that make a team successful. This is true really of companies as well. It's true even of, of families. There are certain things, they say that sometimes that the most important six inches on the field are the ones between your ears. Because there's certain things that go on in, in the minds of the athlete, the minds of the people in a corporation or a family, that greatly determine their success, their impact. One of the most important it factors in sports and in life is confidence. When a person approaches the batter's box thinking that he will get a hit, there's a pretty good chance that he will. And on the flip side, if he walks into the batter's box in the slump and thinking that he's not, you know, very likely to perform well, he most likely won't. It's a strange factor of our existence that God has wired into us. Confidence can be a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you have it, you perform well in some ways because you had it. If you don't, Sometimes you do poorly because, well, you didn't have confidence in the first place. And one of the reasons for this is that confidence enables boldness. There are certain things in life that only come to those who are somewhat bold. You can't get them from being passive. You can't get them from being timid. And wouldn't you know it, there's actually some truth to that as it applies to the Christian life as well. There's a degree of boldness that followers of Christ need to be as effective as possible for the kingdom of God. Turn with me please to the book of Acts chapter 4 
verse 23. The passage we'll be looking at today picks up on a story mid-plot. So we need to go back a little bit to find out how we got to where we are in chapter 4, verse 23. Back in chapter 3, as you may remember from last week, Peter and John, leaders of the early church, healed a man who for his entire life had not been able to walk. He was over 40 years old and had never been able to walk. Peter and John healed him. They did this miracle in the name of Jesus Christ and as a crowd quite naturally gathered, they took the opportunity to explain what had happened and why this Jesus in whose name they had healed the man was so important. Because the religious leaders perceived their teaching and their message as a threat, the leaders put them in custody overnight, then made them testify before the Jewish ruling council about what they had done. And they didn't shrink back at all. Here's how the leaders reacted to their bold response. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. So what did these religious leaders do to these astonishing, uneducated common men who had been with Jesus? They they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. When we pick up the narrative today, we are right at the point where Peter and John have been released from the Jewish ruling council, and I'll ask you uh, to stand, if you would, as we read the main portion of our passage, beginning in verse 23 and continuing through verse 31 in Acts chapter 4. You can follow along in your Bibles, or you'll also see the text of the English Standard Version on the screen. Acts 4.23. When they were released... They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and in, rage in the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now Lord, Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Thank you. You may be seated. That last word, boldness, is the theme of this passage. And as we learn from what happened here, we'll find that there were three phases of boldness that these believers experienced. Three phases of boldness that you find represented on your bulletin outline, on the uh, bulletin that you received as you entered our sanctuary. The first phase, which we learn about in verse 23, we'll call boldness threatened. Boldness threatened. Verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. The believers that Peter and John went to would have certainly heard about the healing, but not necessarily about what had happened in the Jewish ruling council in the hearing, because that may have been a closed door hearing. So we can imagine that the dialogue went something like this. Peter and John come back to their friends and they say, uh, well, we told them that there's salvation in nobody else. Wow, uh, what did they do then? Well, they didn't know what to do because all the people were so amazed by the miracle. So they told us not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Well, what did you say to that? Well, we told them that we have to keep testifying about Jesus because God told us to and we report to God rather than to them. 
Oh man, and they still let you go? Yeah, they just, they just threaten us again, but they had to let us go eventually. So what are we going to do now? What would you have done? It's hard to say unless you were in that specific situation, right? Our minds tell us that we hope we would have kept on speaking without being afraid. But then there is the reality that there was a very real threat placed upon them. What threats have you faced in your life? These might be threats for speaking the gospel of Christ, but it might be something maybe even a little bit more broad than that. Maybe a threat to your security. Maybe a threat to your life. Maybe you've been in a situation where your life was truly in danger. Maybe your home was threatened or, or one of your children. What threats have you faced? Some time ago I was in a country that uh, while you're allowed to share the gospel, it's, it's not necessarily encouraged. And I was having lunch in a cafe. Actually, I and my friends were discussing specifically how we were going to present our testimony to some people later that night. So we're going through discussing this, you know, thinking of these words would be good words to use, these words they won't understand, that one means something different here, that sort of thing. And after we got up and left, we, we went into the street and we were stopped by two uniformed officers that I noticed had been in the restaurant. And they identified themselves as uh, peace and security. That's what the group was, they said. I don't know exactly what that means, maybe some form of FBI or something like that. And they questioned us about, you know, what we were doing and, and why we were there and asked us a lot of questions, some of which we really couldn't answer, certainly didn't want to answer. And they eventually let us go, saying that they might call us in on the following Monday to speak about, uh, you know, to basically give an account, an account for ourselves. Now, they never called us in, and we kind of got a clue that this was probably just an idle threat when we realized that that Monday was a government holiday. So, <laughs> but I got to tell you, that experience really changed the way I look at some things. Do you think it made me think twice when I was sharing my testimony the rest of my time there? You better believe it. Persecution or fear or threats were not abstract to me at that point. In this country, it's rare for someone to face imprisonment or physical harm for his or her faith, but every single one of us has been afraid because our security or our life felt threatened in some way. And how we handle this can, can make a major difference on our capacity to serve God. It can cause us to be timid or to withdraw or to be much more reserved if we don't respond well to the things that make us afraid. And if this isn't addressed, fear can deeply affect our ability to follow Jesus, whether or not that fear even stems from a threat to our faith. So we look and we ask the question, what did the believers do next? Did they hold a pep rally? Did they lodge a formal complaint with the religious authorities? When their boldness was threatened, what did they do? They turned to God, they prayed, and they asked for, you guessed it, boldness. Verse 24, and when they heard it, that is the report from the apostles, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, 
Lord. Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, that's a pretty incredible prayer. I mean, for us to duplicate that would be pretty difficult spontaneously. And it's a longer prayer. We, you know, it took a little while to read, so it's helpful to go back to the beginning of it. When they began the prayer, what did they begin with? Give us boldness, give us confidence, take away the threat. No, the prayer begins, Sovereign Lord. It's always a great idea to begin our prayers with a note of praise to the God under whose sovereignty we live, who protects us. You've noticed, perhaps, in, in the Lord's Prayer, what's, what's the first phrase? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. The, the prayer that Jesus gave the apostles there was a model. They asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And he gave them this model. And it's not coincidental that this praise of the Lord is first. Now, why is that? Because it helps us to orient ourselves to praising him, to his character, to the reality of who he is before we proceed with our requests. And sometimes that even changes the nature of our requests. We don't really know what to pray for anyway, we're told in Scripture. So establishing his sovereignty makes all kinds of sense, particularly in this case, in which the apostles and the disciples of Jesus know that they are, in a sense, under attack. And after establishing that God is the creator of everything and thus the one who's able to control all things, even those who oppose him, they quote from Psalm 2. When you see a text set off, maybe by a, a margins or indenting in the scripture, maybe in the way your version represents it, since it's in italics or something, often the version will have a footnote as to the Old Testament passage that's being quoted. And it's helpful sometimes to look back to that passage for context. In this case, the passage is Psalm 2. And if you read Psalm 2, you'll find that it's all about opposition to God and to his anointed one. It's a perfect choice of psalms to quote from. And what you find out is that when all of these kings and all of these powers set themselves up against God, what is God's response in Psalm 2? He laughs. He laughs. And it's not a laugh like a funny laugh. It's a laugh of derision. It's a laugh of You've got to be kidding me. What is it that's bothering you right now? I trust there, there might be something. Most of us deal with some low level of anxiety most of our days. We don't always think in these terms, but what is it about the nature of God that helps to address that anxiety or that worry? We tend to think of God's characteristics as something that theologians debate. You know, the people who study theology for a living. But God's characteristics are extremely practical when you have a problem. And if nothing else, in this case, God's character and his sovereignty in particular shows that their problem is ultimately not a problem. In this special circumstance, the believers note that what Psalm 2 had, they believe, they're noting what Psalm 2 had predicted long ago, that the religious leaders and the Romans and the people of Israel had fulfilled when they opposed and crucified Jesus. So these same people that were responsible for the death of Christ were now threatening them. But look to verse 28 in the book of Acts. They were gathered together, these opponents, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Well, that's interesting. God, even the opposition and death Christ faced was part of your plan. And thus, the opposition we are facing is part of your plan. So we won't be afraid that something's out of control or that we're on our own or that somehow something slipped past you, God. Man, that is comforting. 
That is comforting when you know that even when something rough is happening, some trial, something you're anxious about, it's not something that just kind of escaped God's notice. If you are in Christ, the scripture says that he has brought that into your life for some good purpose of his that will ultimately work out to your good. So from this position of confidence, the believers, interestingly, don't even bother to ask for the threats to stop. What do they request? There's three things they request. First, they say, Lord, consider their threats. In other words, take notice. Recognize the situation this puts us in and act in light of those threats. Second, act in light of those threats by granting to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. This is the essence of the prayer. Let us be bold. Some people are just naturally bold and boisterous. You probably think of somebody when I say that, right? These are people who like when everybody else is quiet, uh, they're the one who speaks up and says, excuse me. Or the one, you know, everybody else is like, no, I'm not going to send the dinner plate back. And they're like, hey, no problem. Hey, I'll, in fact, I'll send it back for you. <laughs> That's not what's going on here. This is not natural boldness, right? This is supernatural boldness that they're asking for. So people that aren't abnormally bold, becoming abnormally bold because of the activity of the Spirit of God. One last item they request, Lord, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, are they requesting miracles so the threats will stop? No. I mean, they might be saying something like, hey, Lord, a few miracles wouldn't hurt here. The point of the miracles is, if you, if you look at the context, is, is not so much to wow people or to make their lives easier. It's to help them to be more effective in their ministry. When you, when you preach Jesus, which is a new message for these folks, and all of a sudden you accompany that with miraculous signs, well, that gives you a lot of credibility, doesn't it? The believers had received threats. Their boldness had been threatened. Their response was to request boldness of the Lord so that they could keep testifying to Jesus. But what would God do? What would his response be? We see it in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, if you're paying close attention, you may see some similarities between what happens here and what happened a few weeks ago at the festival of Pentecost and the outpouring of God's Spirit. One is the physical phenomena that are going on. So at Pentecost, there was, you remember, the sound of rushing wind and these tongues of fire that separated and were kind of hovering over the believers. Now, that's not happening here, but what is happening is there seems to be like a localized earthquake. What's the point of this shaking? Well, it doesn't really say, but um, that's a pretty clear demonstration that a power greater than you is at work, right? Another similarity between the two passages is this phrase, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is somewhat misunderstood, and we'll have opportunities to talk about the Spirit of God as, as we have for the last several years in our sermons. The Spirit of God is the third person of the Trinity. You may, you may know this. You, you may not be real familiar with the idea of the Spirit of God, but it's important for us to understand, particularly in this passage, that the Spirit of God is not a force. It's not like Star Wars. So we refer to the Spirit of God actually as He. We don't refer to the Spirit of God as It because the Spirit of God is a person. In Luke's accounts, the filling of the Spirit indicates particularly an empowerment for some kind of special mission for God. And that's exactly what's happening here. The Spirit is filling them so that they will be empowered to go out and do something amazing for God. One unique thing in this passage is the statement that the believers continued to speak the word of God with boldness. 
So God had given them what they requested. Now, there's no, there's no mention in here that the threat will stop, but they are going to have supernatural boldness to be witnesses for Christ. When their boldness was threatened, the early church turned to God, praising him for his power and position as creator, and they asked him to make them bold to keep sharing about Jesus. He graciously granted their request. It's always fun uh, and somewhat difficult to think about how we can digest a passage of the Bible and apply it to our lives. That's why you remember in math class, application questions are more difficult than the rote memory stuff. It takes a little extra thought. It's unlikely that you've been called before a religious council and been threatened and told not to speak in the name of Jesus. It's possible that something like that happened at work maybe in your family, but by God's grace, it's pretty rare that this sort of thing happens to us in our culture. So the question for us today is this, how can we obey what God is instructing us here? What's the general principle that we can apply more broadly? I believe it's this, God's boldness overcomes any threat. God's boldness will overcome any threat to us. Think for a moment about the threats you face to serving God. Some of these threats involve direct opposition from people. Many more of these threats involve situations or circumstances that threaten you, intimidate you, maybe even tempt you to withdraw into yourself. There could be a financial threat to you that's very scary. And if that threat causes you to be timid, and fearful, and overly questioning, and overly analytical maybe. The effect of that threat, it's going to carry far beyond your finances, isn't it? Kind of spill over into other areas of life. Another area where this happens sometimes is in our health or in the health of our loved ones. Health concerns can feel terribly threatening. They can paralyze us from pursuing God's call in our lives. Whatever the threat may be, God's boldness can overcome that threat so that we can be strong to pursue the mission he has called us to. God doesn't promise to eliminate the threat, and the early believers didn't even request that. In faith, they requested the boldness of God, and he granted it abundantly. I'd like to invite our worship team to come sing a final song and we're going to do something we don't do every Sunday, but as we've spoken about threats, as we've spoken about things that are worrying you or on your mind, things that, to which you want to submit yourself before God and say, God, I'm entrusting myself to you for your boldness. I'm going to pray that you would give me the boldness necessary to thrive in the midst of this threat. I want to invite you to come as we sing and, and, and pray here at the altar. You don't have to tell anybody what the threat is. You don't have to tell anybody why you need boldness. But if there's something on your heart you'd like your church family to support you in, in praying for that, we'd love to pray with you here. Uh, feel free, you can also pray where you're seated, but we'd love to support you in that process. So feel free to come forward to the altar. You know, if you haven't known what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and to even be able to deal with these sorts of threats, Maybe that's something that you would like to do today. You want to say, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. And through faith, I'm going to trust him to deliver me from the penalty of sin that I could not be delivered from myself. I believe that he was crucified for my sin and was raised from the dead. And today, I want to ask him to be my savior, to give me eternal life and to grant me the boldness that I'm going to need to walk that road. Join us as we sing, and if you have some requests before the Lord, please join us up front here. We'd be glad to pray for you.